Hey, hey, what's good? Your boy No Love just hitting you once again. I uh, got a new little video I'm trying to put out before the year ends. Today is uh, the 31st, December 2022. Um, so this is going to be the last video of the year going right here. Um, just from one of my magazine collections that I have. It's an old school, I think March 2007 issue of Garage Magazine. Um, old school publication. It's not around anymore. I haven't really seen anything on it, but... Uh, yeah, this is a good little issue right here. It has a Pachuca's um, uh, issue that everybody might be interested in. A good article on here. Touches on quite a few things that you really don't hear about. Uh, this issue was kind of like a tribute to women. Kind of like rebellious, badass women. Um, people who just were out of the norm in society back in the days uh, that these articles were uh, focused on. Um, I'm not going to get into every single article. I'm just, like I said, be in uh, past videos. I just kind of uh, read the articles that um, kind of are relevant to my followers or people, you know, because a lot of people wouldn't be interested in like 85% of the articles in here. Uh, so I'm just going to go with the one that I think everybody might be interested in. So hope you like it. Uh, don't trip on the noise outside. It's a rainy ass day today. It's been raining shit hardcore for like the last few days. Uh, we had a hell of a storm last night over here. Um, so if you hear rain outside, yep, it's a rainy day. That's why we get one of these videos. So hope you enjoy it and let's see what we got going on. So, like I said, this is a 2007 issue right here, Garage Magazine, out of San Francisco, I believe. Um, this is the woman's issue, so you're going to see a lot of different things all go do, uh, down the table of contents. A very special guest editor, a recurring theme, Rebel Style, Fun for a Girl or a Boy, Tim Condor, Jenny Lenz, Wanda Jackson, Just Shut Your Mouth, The Story of My Life, Get Your Boots Off the Bar, Go Placidly, World's Fastest Bunny, and American in Paris, 20 Questions with Kat Von D, Nicole Lyons, Aaron Tuffle, and Las Pachucas, The History of the Original Homegirl. So yeah, I had Kat Von D on the cover. Um, she was a well-known tattoo artist, still does it, I believe. Um, so they had her kind of repping the tattoo genre. So here's what we got going on. And this is like a gearhead uh, magazine, I believe. Didn't really read it too much back in the day when it was out, but when I seen this issue, went through it, seen it uh, on the shelf, and uh, seen that Pachuca's uh, article. So I had to add it to my collection back then. And yeah, this isn't a magazine you can really find a lot, so... Let's see, about our cover. For this special edition, our Chicks Rule issue, we couldn't think of a girl who was any more of a ruler than the one and only Kat Von D, and the only photographer who could make this cover come to life was the inimitable, invincible, totally corruptible, and liable Estevan Oriol. Another alleged accomplice to this shoot was our own Trevelin, or Super Company Customs fame. He supplied us with the spot on Chevy Lolo and the appropriately dangerous hood back alley location in central Los Angeles. Want to see a bunch of stone thugs jump? Just swing into the back alley in a slate gray late model crown Vic a little too quickly and cock the front wheels in an aggressive stance. Just ask Brian. Model Kat Von D. Photographer Estevan Oriol. Assistants Nate Assassin. Bronson Skinhead Rob. Wardrobe stylist, Kat Von D, hair and makeup, Jen Ziliotto, a car 67 Chevy Caprice by Super Company Customs, LA Califas, um, location LA. So let's see what we got going on in this one. I said this one is a gearhead magazine so you're gonna see a lot of hot rod kind of shit they actually got really good pictures in a lot of these articles not gonna lie I was a fan of uh, a lot of the old school stuff a lot of black and white stuff they have in here <laughs> I like this one a little dog ready to roll right there looks like my dog Bob Story of my life, Cherry Martini finds her way in a hot rod.
get your boots off the bar. Many experts just scratch their heads and wonder what kind of Indian this is. It's the only one. I'm assuming she was a uh, early biker. Go placidly among the noise and haste. The photography of Eve Crane. We got old school HA shit. Uh, Frisco right there. Look at that. For those that say they don't call it Frisco, yeah, they've always called it Frisco. So, it's just proof. Old school photos right there. You know, I might come back to this story sometime uh, if I ever get a chance. I know I've read it before, but uh, like I said, we're focusing on the other article today. This bunny, Carol Bunny Bur Burkett. Yeah, Carol Burkett, ladies' driver permit. Sunny Buick. What's this one? Not too familiar with that. Kind of cool art. I like this one right here. Cap on D. I do wish unicorns would come back in style already. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see. Oh, center fold right there. Uh, old send out right here. Got those out, send them in. Get your subscription. Break phobia. Nicole Lyons can't slow down. When I was seven, he said, You're going to learn how to drive this thing. That's a pretty sick photo. Uh, Pretty nice. Good looking article right there also. Like I said, this is the, you know, like badass chicks article. Three epiphanies of Aaron Tuffle. Girls kick butt. I guess she's a fighter. So yeah, like anybody interested in uh, this one, you might want to look online if you can find one. Good luck. Um, I only seen the one back in the day and never seen one since. So here's the article I was talking about. Pachuca is a history of the original homegirl. Story by Miriam Arbu, Arba. Photos, Jeff Cordner. So let's get into this one. Mom knew that I idolized my cousin Jackie, a mischief maker immune to discipline by belt, wooden spoon, and hand. And during the long drive to Los Angeles at Christmas time, Mom always warned me, don't become that girl's accomplice in any of her travesuras. Jackie lived in Norwalk with her mom, my Aunt Vicky, at Grandma's house. A post-war lavender track home with bars on its windows. Mom kept an eye on Jackie and me as we played, but we always managed to steal away and have some real fun. Once, Jackie dared me to feed my little sister dog food and, eager to impress, I ran to the kitchen for a can opener and spatula. Another time, we knotted Grandma's boyfriend's shoelaces together after he passed out in the Lazy Boy from a turkey overdose. Jackie played me Zapp and Roger's ghetto anthems on her boombox, but when Mom overheard me echoing the rhymes of Jackie's favorite MC, Too Short, she washed my mouth out with soap good. Aunt Vicky called Mom during the summer before high school to ask if she could send Jackie to stay with us. Vicky explained that she was becoming a royal pain in the ass, and Mom said, sure, maybe all Jackie needed was the countryside sunshine and fresh air. Mom drove the Pinto and I rode in the passenger seat gazing at the strawberry and broccoli fields lying on our town's outskirts. We parked in front of the Blink and You Missed It Greyhound station and waited. 
Finally, Jackie's bus pulled up an hour late and its narrow door opened. Passengers spilled forth and I saw Jackie. She descended the steps and I watched her Nike Cortez shod foot hit the pavement. Orale, la green eyes hath arrived, she boomed. A stiff peacock fan of hair famed her thickly made up face. Her short, curvy frame swam in an oversized Raider jersey and khakis. Three black dots symbolizing her allegiance to La Vida Loca were inked into the flesh between her thumb and index finger. Dios mio, mom gasped. My niece is a chola. I knew what cholas were, although dad chose to raise my sister and me in sleepy coastal hamlet of Santa Maria to guard us from such things. Toughest titanium locas thrive in all environments, and my podunk elementary school is no exception. In sixth grade, the girl who sat beside me showed up to class with the black eye one morning. She carved Park Street 13 on her desk and by seventh grade, I called her dreamer instead of mighty soul. Her lethally thin pencil drawn eyebrows mesmerized me and I wondered which grew in her expanding belly, a future homeboy or a future homegirl. Dad should have known better. Los Angeles is Los Angeles, his hometown created the inescapable, the inescapable legacy of Las Pachucas, all Chicanas and her heirs, whether we embrace the reality or not. The descriptions often reduce La Pachuca, the matriarch of all brown girl rebels, to arm candy. The mere mole of Natalie dressed suit suitor, her true story blast offensive stereotype for today's Latinas. La Pachuca stands as an icon of Chicana defiance, strength, and female solidarity. Skateboarding senoritas, low riding rucas, Harvard bound homegirls, and tattooed rockabilly monas all owe her a debt of gratitude for kicking down the patriarchal puerta and holding the door open for the rest of us. Pachucas emerged from a youth subculture, Pachuquismo, which crystallized during the Second World War in neighborhoods east of the Los Angeles River. Similar, similar tastes and circumstances united them all girl cliques with names like the Cherries and the Vamps. These friends jitterbug to swing and jazz music, spoke a common dialect, Galo, and fearlessly paraded the streets of their working class barrios like Boyle Heights sporting the Zulu. Pachucas in Los Angeles in the 40s cultivated a particularly flamboyant and unique version of the look, according to Professor Catherine Sue Ramirez, author of the forthcoming book, The Woman Zoot Suitor. The fingertip coat, a short, uh, the fingertip coat, a short full skirt, and zombie slippers of huaraches type of typified the Pachucas outfit. So did hair ratted into a tall, sometimes peroxided coif. Heavy makeup like dark lipstick often adorned the pachuca's face and at times she wore socks provocatively pulled part way up her can uh, her calves especially brave pachuca's wrist to rest by wearing masculine versions of the zoot suit punjabi pants a fingertip coat and a shirt and tie nancy valverde an old school los angeles dyke donned such homeboy garb born to shoeless poor parents in 1932 in Deming, New Mexico. Her family moved to California in 1941 after dropping out of school in the sixth grade. Valverde did a brief stint in reform school and then let the streets educate her. By 1946, she was hawking local weed, fencing stolen goods, and pimping whores, however. Los Angeles police busted her solely for her crimes of fashion, dressing like a masculine dandy and wearing short hair. By 17, I was making pretty good money, Valverde, they said. She spent most of her black market profits at the elusive men's store Via Montes, buying shirts at $22 a pop and slacks for 18 a pretty penny in 1941. Her tailored togs drew police attention in Valverde. They had discovered that women dressed like pachucos were considered masquerading, cop lingo for cross-dressing, cross which was prohibited by city ordinance. When cops stopped Valverde, they asked her if she was wearing a bra. Shit, she proudly replied, I don't need it. The cops ordered her into the back seat of their squad car and booked her for masquerading. They stripped her, kept her nice duds, and sent her home in rags. Valverde fought the masquerading charges, but the Los Angeles Police Department continued harassing the shit out of her. Today, disability benefits sustain her. Valverde receives them due to an injury she suffered as a result of police abuse during the arrest for wearing the wrong clothing. Ramirez and other body historians like Joan W. Ramirez de-emphasized the girl's participation in criminal enterprise. 
Although Pachucas did affiliate with gangs, membership in the clique provided an important social network. Early gang girls enjoyed each other's company, hung out at one another's pad, and went teeny bopping, uh, teeny bopper nuts for the same songs like Joe Ligon's 1945 hit, The Honey Dripper. While some homegirls did engage in crime like dope slanging and strong arm stickups, Pachucas didn't become nationally recognized as hoodlums until the racist mainstream media cast the spotlight on them. Tabloids demonized Pachucas throughout their coverage of events that began on the eve of August 1st, 1942. Dora Barrios and her boyfriend Hank Levas parked at Sleepy Lagoon, a local swimming hole that doubles as a lover's lane. A gang, the Downey Boys, attacked them and beat them both, so Levas and Barrios returned to their neighborhood of 38th Street together, reinforcements. They returned to the lagoon with friends and found that Downey boys parting with the, at the nearby Williams Ranch. 38th Street crashed the Pachanga and had a mad rumble ensued. Once the dust settles, Badio noticed the 22-year-old Jose Diaz laying bleeding. He died hours later at the Los Angeles County General Hospital. The Los Angeles Times blamed the death on a Pachuco crime wave. Police conducted the dragnet raids and picked up girls, says Ramirez. They forced them to testify against male defendants charged with murder. The Times named... The 14 and 15 year old girls called to testify before a grand jury listed others like 19 year old Lorena Encinas among the murderous hoodlums involved in the terroristic attack. The Times exaggerated the danger girl gangs poised in the Los Angeles County, suggesting strange initiation rites. The paper hyped the story of 14 year old Bertha Aguilar who admitted to hair pulling at the August Rumble while at Diaz murder trial, one defendant testified that a, a Pachuca was seen cracking a guy with a beer bottle. Following a mass trial that Pachuco defender Kerry McWilliams dubbed a ceremonial lynching, 17 boys were convicted of crimes ranging from first degree murder to assault. The 38th Street girls, however, however got no day in court. Francis Silva, Josefina, Juanito Gonzalez, Dora Barrios, and Lorena Encinas never received due process and were incarcerated at the Ventura School for Girls, a reformatory with a draconian reputation. Most of the Sleepy Lagoon girls arrived there at age 14 or 15, says Ramirez. They were finally released at age 21. And Cena's paid the heavy price for her refusal to cooperate, but the sacrifice was worth it. Upon release, and Cena's proved that reform school had not eroded her strength or spirit. She worked riveting, she worked riveting bomber aircraft until the end of the war. Married and later adopted a baby girl in 1991. Dying of cancer, she confessed to the powerful secret she had guarded for so many years. Her beloved little brother. Luis Jesus murdered Jose Diaz. And Cines was a true pachuca. She embodied loyalty and solidarity with family, hood, and homies. Sometimes white interpreted such virtues as disobedience. Others in the context of war interpreted them as downright unpatriotic. In the summer of 1943, Los Angeles tensions exploded into the Zoot Suit riots. White servicemen hunted down Pachucos to discipline them. Allegations of Pachucos allegedly molesting white women fueled the rage. Mobs of uniformed sailors, desuited Mexican Zoot Suiters, beat them and cropped their ducktail hairdos. In the defense, Pachucos claimed that for months, white servicemen had been antagonizing them by leering at Pachucas on their turf. Ensuing scuffles leading up to the riots were attempts to protect their women. When we frame the riots in terms of sexual tensions between the two warring groups of men, the context reduces women to pawns, says Ramirez. They become sex objects when in reality, women gave meaning to the events occurring around them and reacted. Pachucas, Gloria Rios described the riots as surreal, like being on a movie set, and perhaps the most powerful statement many Pachucas made was that they chose to stay home. I wasn't going to wear my drapes then, one told Ramirez about laying down dramatic tabloid accounts of brass knuckle wearing Pachucas prolonging the riots appearing in the times, but the reality is much more staid. In later years, Chicano playwrights, poets, activists redeemed the Pachuco and made him a legendary figure. University of California professor Rosa Salinda Fregoso describes El Pachuco's transgressions as culturally affirming and the embodiment of a revolutionary identity. In her essay on Cool Chuca style, Fregoso argues that Chicanos have been reluctant to redeem La Pachuca because she constantly
constitutes multiple threats, particularly to sex and gender norms. Labor leader Cesar Chavez bluntly summarized in an interview with Lowrider magazine that the girls also wore their thrapples and their parents said, if you wear them, you're no good, you whores. Las Pachucas rebellion spelled trouble for months. Dads, whites, Mexicans, men, and Americans silencing her because easier than facing her challenges. However, despite reformation and attempts by law enforcement officials, civic leaders, and embarrassed parents, Pachucas never disappeared. She marched into the 50s, squeezing into a pencil skirt and falling in love with Elvis. In the 60s and 70s, she became a chola with heavy coal rimming in her eyebrows. In her eyes, the tall beehive hairdo rumored to hide a race so she could handle with ease. In the 70s and 80s, she became a tomboyish gangster like my cousin La Green Eyes. Today, La Pachuca expresses her postmodern homegirl identity in a myriad of ways. She's the Salvador, she's the Salvadoreña tagger showing off her first bomb on MySpace.com, the hip-hop hoochie gyrating the reggaeton, and the ex-thug cooking at Father Greg, uh, Gregory's Homegirl Cafe. Nuestra arena, La Pachuca, we salute you. So yeah, that was uh, that was the article right there. It's some pretty good pictures in here. Some good old school stuff. Um, you kind of have to go searching for some of these images. I've never really seen this one outside the magazine. I think it was exclusive to this uh, issue. Um, I think this one as well. That one would definitely be a part of it. But yeah, it was a good layout. Uh, good story in here. Um, so yeah, that was it. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. I'll uh, we'll go through the rest of the magazine. So, yeah, this was Garage. Like I said, I had some pretty good photos in there. I like this one. Wanda Jackson, Oklahoma Twister. With Elvis. So that was it. So yeah, I thought this was a pretty good issue right here. Had that good interview. Uh, one of the things I really liked about the interview was when they interviewed the uh, older lady from the 40s. Uh, the quote unquote uh, dyke chick. Uh, I like that one. That was a pretty good one. I like touching on that subject. Like it's always been something that's been kind of, um, I don't know, like I've been interested in it. Uh, I tried to uh, kind of do an interview or like a video on it back in the day uh reached out to some homegirls from san jose and kind of wanted to touch on like you know that side uh, a lot of people don't talk about that because if you if you're from the hood if you're one of the homies you've been around you know there's always like a couple like lesbian homegirls dressed like dude slick back hair in a ponytail like i can almost describe it down to a t you know dress just like one of the homies and they put in work like the homies you know like i know a lot of them that have fought more dudes and they probably fought chicks you know and they've been out there putting in work too so um, I always thought it was interesting, you know, just one of those topics like nobody really gets on. And I tried to do it. Unfortunately, it never came together. I was never able to basically, I guess, get the OK because she had hit up a few people, asked them about it, but they weren't interested in it. You know, it was one of those before everybody was doing a YouTube video, before everybody wanted to jump from the camera. Nobody wanted to jump from the camera. It was hard to like get on issues like that. So I really like that they touched on that one in this magazine because, yeah, it's like it's a real thing. And back then. And it's just crazy to know that they would get busted for dressing like a man you know for masquerading um as was the charge called back then and yeah they would get time and you know do time for shit like that so um just a trip to know uh, if you got any stories like that you've heard from you know your uh old school you know grandparents uncles aunts things like that you know post them in the comments but I, i've heard about these things before and like i said i've seen the homegirls out there and they've been putting in work and they get treated just like the dudes sometimes so a lot of them live lives harder than some of the dudes in the hood so um just one of those things i thought it was a really good uh, issue to touch on 
um yeah so that's one of the things that made me kind of interested in the article really liked it uh the other stuff i mean you could find a lot of stories on those as far as like uh sleepy lagoon that one's been touched on many times pretty much any like chicano chicana history book you read that's one of the ones they touch on when they go through the 40s world war ii around that time um that was a big issue uh it's a good one to tap into if you've never read on it i would advise you to look into it the uh i think it's 38th street sleepy lagoon uh murder case big thing a lot of things went on during that time uh like they were saying people were getting stripped of their clothes uh cesar chavez the um a civil rights activist he actually got stripped of his clothes i think it was in like bakersfield or delano cops pulled up he said he had his new shark skin zoot suit cops did not like that shit pulled out a knife cut it up um they cut up all his clothes uh, left him right there where he was so it's one of those things he even said himself like he wanted to kill those cops for doing that shit and it's an old lowrider interview they actually reference it in this interview um but yeah it's from the 80s it's an old school one they have and there's a lot of good stuff in that interview but i remember that one and he talks about that issue so you know it'd been going back a long time and a lot of people dealt with it even people like him had to deal with it so uh, i can imagine how many stories never got told and if you like look through old school stories from the 40 newspaper articles i've looked through a lot of them you see that shit happen all over like i've seen issues out of oakland uh richmond other parts of the bay area that dealt with that when that pachuco shit was going down so it wasn't just happening like la or you know san diego it was happening up and down california um wherever they had people stationed so that was a big issue and so if you look into it you'll see a lot of that i posted old school articles of that myself before uh but yeah like i said you know it's one of those things some of these issues are a lot easier to find than others like i said sleepy lagoon you'll find that in many books on the subject uh, but a lot of these other ones you have to dig on and if you dig through history you'll find it so this was just uh, another one of those good articles that touched on things you don't hear about a women's issue they did a good job uh, this one i'll keep in the collection for years to come but just thought i'd put it out there for other people that uh, never get to find this issue um, now you got that story too so hope you enjoyed it much love for checking out remember like subscribe comment all that shit let's get to a billion followers one day first you know homeboy with a billion followers but uh yeah much love for checking it out stay up and uh happy new year